Hi guys, my name is Jack, and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. From love to hate. On the night of December 1st, 2010, Staff Sergeant Nathan Payett was in a hurry. He was late for duty at Nellis Air Force Base in Nevada. By a strange coincidence, his alarm clock, which never failed to go off, did not ring today. Nathan woke up at 11 p.m. and woke up his wife, Michelle. He took a shower, said goodbye to his family. Then he went out to the garage. He was about to put on his uniform and start the car. Suddenly, loud shots rang out from behind. Mr. Payette's children and wife came running to the noise. On the doorstep stood Nathan, bleeding and staggering from side to side. It was obvious that he was about to fall. Michelle was terrified and rushed towards her husband to pick him up, but not in time. The father of the family collapsed to the floor. Around 11.30 p.m., 911 received a call. My husband has been shot. He's bleeding. Help him! Mrs. Payette screamed into the phone. The dispatcher immediately explained to the woman how to administer first aid. Michelle tried to give artificial respiration to her spouse. However, it did not bring relief. After the arrival of rescuers, he was taken to the nearest hospital. Doctors did everything possible to save the patient. Despite this, it was not possible to bring the young man back to life. The neck wound became fatal for 28-year-old Nathan Payet. After Mrs. Payette was informed of her husband's death, her life was divided into before and after. An exemplary family man, a valiant serviceman, was murdered on the doorstep of his own home in Las Vegas. His death caused a public outcry. Relatives, acquaintances, and just concerned citizens were waiting for explanations from the police. Who could decide to such lawlessness? What motives pursued the criminal and was subsequently brought to justice? These and other questions we will try to analyze together with you. Nathan Joseph Villagomez Payette was born on February 12, 1982, in the village of Tamuning, Guam. The territory of the island is not part of the United States of America, but it is a possession of the United States. At the same time, the United States determines foreign policy and does not interfere in internal affairs. Guam is a small island in the Pacific Ocean. Due to its paradisiacal beauty and historical past, this area is especially popular among tourists. Nathan was not only born in an amazing region, he was also fortunate to have a large and loving family. He had three brothers, Matthew, Anthony, Eric, and one sister, Carmela. The children were very friendly and helped their parents in everything. Nathan himself was different from the others in that he never caused trouble. He was a caring child at home and a diligent student at school. The boy was very sociable, so he easily made friends. He was the soul of the company. His name was always on the rumor. Perhaps there was no one who did not want to communicate with him, recalled about him brother Eric. Living near the ocean, Nathan loved swimming from childhood. Later, he began surfing. He spent all his free time on the beach, enjoying the sun and life. Nathan met his future wife during his studies at South High School. The educational institution was located in the neighboring town of Santa Rita. Michelle Ann Vonta Chuck was attracted to him at first sight. Young people began to spend time together. With each day, their affection for each other only grew. They never parted. Together, they studied at school, prepared for classes, helped with household chores. Strong teenage friendship was replaced by tender love. When Michelle was 16 years old, a terrible grief befell her family. Her mother died. Therefore, the girl spent all her free time helping her sister. Melissa, the eldest of Chuck's family, took on the role of mother and mistress of the house. Nathan supported her in everything she did and helped to look after the younger children. In 2000, after graduation, Nathan decided to propose to Michelle. The girl happily accepted. Their families did not have the opportunity to have a wedding. Therefore, the couple with the blessing of their parents decided to move in together. To earn a living, the guy got a job as a receptionist in a local hotel. He earned not badly. There was enough money. However, like all young people, Nathan and Michelle were ambitious. They made plans for their own home and independence. Soon their son Dion was born in the Payette family. The income was no longer enough to cover the necessary expenses. 
Therefore, the guy thought about a job that could provide his family with a decent existence. This desire led Nathan to join the Air Force. After graduation, Nathan was assigned to the Elmendorf Air Base in Anchorage, Alaska. Michelle was left alone with the baby, but the family had money. In addition, after a while, the young people's dream came true. They built their own house. In it was born a second child, a daughter named Niara. The head of the family made success in the military field. This favored the desire to achieve everything that he and his wife had previously been deprived of. Finally, six years after their engagement, Michelle and Nathan had a big wedding. My mom was extremely proud that her youngest son was the first to go out and achieve something, Eric said. In 2006, Nathan was transferred to the davis Monthan military base in Arizona. He was promoted to the position of weapons loading team leader for the A-10 Thunderbolt attack aircraft of one of the Essex squadrons. There he also trained in logistics training and material management. Nathan definitely loved his job and did it with dedication. Most importantly, he did it with the best of intentions. He was a son of his country. One of his co-workers characterized him. In 2007, Nathan and his family moved to Nellis Air Base. The new job was located near Las Vegas, Nevada. There, the young man was assigned as an assistant junior officer in charge of the supply section for maintenance of combat aircraft. Along with professional growth, the family of the protagonist grew. Soon, the Payette couple had two more sons, Drossen and David. Michelle fell in love with Las Vegas. She thought it was the best place to live, so Nathan decided to make her happy. He chose the most suitable house for a large family spacious and bright. In addition, the future family home was 30 to 40 minutes away from the military base. Nathan made the down payment with his savings. The only thing left to do was to divide the family's income and expenses wisely. Maybe he could save some money temporarily, at least until Mr. Payette's next prospects. At first, Michelle was delighted with her husband's surprise. She set about organizing the everyday life in the new house. However, over time, the demands of the couple began to grow. The family spent more than Nathan earned. The happiness of buying a new house began to fade. It is well known that financial difficulties have ruined the relationship of more than one couple. Nathan and Michelle were no exception to this axiom. The man realized that the deplorable situation had to be corrected. Therefore, in mid-2009, when the USA was at war with Iraq, Nathan enlisted as a volunteer. His departure took six months. During this time, the family's condition improved considerably, which Nathan could not help but enjoy. After a short rest at home, Sergeant Payet decided to return to Iraq. While Nathan was risking his life, Michelle was overcome by anxiety. She had intrusive thoughts. The prospect of being alone with four children frightened her. Accustomed to a certain standard of living, she found it hard to imagine otherwise. To take her mind off her worries, Mrs. Payet took a job. The firm that took the new hire was a corporate credit card telemarketing firm. Employment brought variety and new acquaintances to the woman's routine. In addition, Michelle wanted to have her own safety cushion. She did not rule out having her own business in the future, so she actively engaged in self-development. She began to attend the School of Aesthetics. Everything went on as usual while Nathan was at home. When he left, Michelle became bored. The birth of the children, the endless travels, and her husband's service cooled the relationship between the couple. Nathan was away for long periods of time, and Michelle wanted to be loved and desired. So she took a lover. It became her colleague, Michael Rudolph Rodriguez, 31-year-old handsome and a local womanizer. Plus, the man was devious and dishonest. He spent 2007 in prison for forgery and attempted theft. Michelle couldn't resist sweet Rudy. That's what they jokingly called Michael behind his back. By the end of 2009, Nathan returned home. It seemed that the distance and the ordeal went in favor of the family relationship. However, this was not the case. The wife was playing a double game. She did not want to lose her husband, having an infatuation on the side. Therefore, she tried to please him in every way. 
Nathan was fascinated by the changes that had taken place in her appearance and character. The children had been growing up without a father for a long time, which had a negative impact on their education. He decided not to leave his family for a long time. It did not occur to him that the striking changes Michelle could be associated with treason, so pure and faithful was Nathan himself. In Las Vegas, a man found a good way to earn money. In order to get double pay, he started working night shifts. In addition, Nathan took up private teaching. He developed training for simplified baseball for young children. As for Michelle's pretense, it didn't last long. As soon as the usual standard of living began to fall, the spouse changed her attitude to the opposite. After a while, the problems in the couple's relationship went beyond. At Thanksgiving in 2010, the young family was visited by brother Eric and his wife Veronica. For the first time, the guests sensed the tension between the pets. They had changed beyond recognition. It seemed that the former feelings between Michelle and Nathan completely disappeared. The couple could not hide from outsiders, not only personal, but also financial problems, almost empty pantry and refrigerator. A week later. On December 1st, 2010, a strange communication took place between Mrs. Payette and Mr. Rodriguez. At 11.12 p.m., Michelle received a text message from Michael. Hope you are feeling better, the man wrote. Van Dyke's contract for tomorrow is almost finalized. Two minutes later, he sent another text. If you're not feeling well, let me know. I'll give you a couple days to rest. Remember, I appreciate your help. At 11.19 p.m., Michelle replied, My husband just recently woke me up. Right now, he is trying to leave the house, but I think he's going to be late today. LOL, I'm sorry the contract is giving you so much trouble. A couple months before the tragedy, Michelle didn't want to be with Nathan, nor was she going to leave him, because she realized that breaking up wouldn't do anything, except headaches and empty pockets. I don't think he will forgive me and support me after the divorce, Michelle thought. The alimony would hardly be enough for a normal life. In addition, Mrs. Pyatt was aware of her husband's military insurance. In the event of his death, Payments totaling about $650,000 were due to the wife. These sinful thoughts did not give rest to the woman's sick mind. One day she shared them with Michael. Surprisingly, he was intrigued. So the terrible idea of Nathan's former lover turned into a cunning plan. Mr. Rodriguez knew that Michelle and he could not do it alone. It was too complicated. So he enlisted his friend, Corey Alexis Hawkins, in the criminal scheme. The 33-year-old mercenary had about nine convictions, each one of them related to theft or fraud. Corey was a hardened criminal, so he agreed to help on the condition of a substantial reward. He estimated his participation at $20,000. After thinking hard, Michelle and Michael agreed. A little later, a couple more people joined their group. 23-year-old Jessica Austin, Corey's girlfriend, and her friend Shannon. By the way, Jessica's friend was not particularly intelligent. She earned her living by starring in adult movies. Shannon was offered 5% of Corey and Jessica's royalties for her help. The fabulous money turned the woman's head. The original plan was to shoot Nathan in his Chevrolet Tahoe. After that, the criminals intended to drive the car with the man's body and leave it in the parking lot of one of the apartment complexes. Jessica had to buy the things necessary for the crime, men's gloves, a car cover, and a fragrance. Shannon's job was to provide an alibi for Michael. If anything, she had to confirm that on the day of the murder, Michael was by her side. On December 1st, 2010, Michelle felt ill. She deviated from her usual schedule and reported home at around 5.30 p.m. Michelle did not normally arrive so early. Her classes at beauty school were ending late, around 10.40 p.m., Mrs. Payette's foot crossed the threshold of the house just five minutes before Nathan left for work. On that unfortunate day, Michelle saw her husband sleeping on the sofa. She woke him up and suggested that they go upstairs to lie together. He didn't object. That was the last night the couple spent together. Late for work, Nathan went downstairs. Just at that time, Michelle was corresponding with Michael. 
In order not to arouse suspicion, the accomplices corresponded using code words. The instigator himself, along with his accomplice, was sitting in a black Cadillac SRX. The car was parked just ahead of the future victim's house. The perpetrators wore latex gloves so as not to leave any traces. Michael realized that the sergeant's military training could play into the latter's hands, so he decided to take him by surprise and approached him from behind. Michael drew his pistol and shot Nathan five times in the back. Michael quickly ran out of the garage, got into his car, and drove away. The perpetrators then fled to a previously prepared place. They burned the clothes in the fireplace and disposed of the rest of the evidence. After that, Michael with Shannon went to the hotel. In this way, the couple wanted to create an alibi. In parallel, Jessica engaged in a thorough cleaning of the apartment in which they stayed. Together with the emergency services, police officers arrived at the scene. They were stunned by what had happened. The neighborhood where the Payette family lived was considered one of the exemplary ones. Detective Todd Williams first decided to examine the scene of the shooting. The garage door was unlocked. There was a noticeable odor of iron inside the room. Blood was smeared on the walls and the car, and traces of it were also visible on the floor. Next to Nathan's uniform were his keys and wallet. Since the valuables were untouched, a robbery murder was ruled out. After examining the scene, Detective Lori Anderson decided to talk to the victim's wife. Michelle explained what had happened. For some reason, she added that the family was struggling financially. This gave the police some ideas. Maybe Nathan was hiding something from his wife. For example, a gambling addiction, debts, or an affair on the side. At least that would have cleared up the attack. Besides, all the evidence pointed to Nathan being deliberately set up. The police examined the victim's cell phone. It contained only pictures of his wife and children. This convinced the officers that Mr. Pyatt was a decent man. The investigation continued. The next step in the search for the perpetrator was to canvass the neighborhood. Statistically speaking, there's always someone who saw or heard something. This was the case with Nathan. Some neighbors reported that they had seen a car parked near the Payette house. The car was driven by a man wearing a brown sweatshirt. After shots were fired, the vehicle immediately drove away. Detectives finally had a lead. Nathan's family was shocked to learn what had happened. His family was on the first flight out of Guam. They were waiting for answers. His mother, Carmelita Pyatt, cried the whole way. The woman couldn't believe her son had died so early. The relatives finally reached the victim's home. Michelle threw herself into her mother-in-law's arms and then lost consciousness. Nathan's mother sensed something unnatural in her daughter-in-law's reaction. For some reason, the fainting seemed faked. The investigators decided to talk to Mrs. Payette again. They asked her about the car that the witnesses had seen. Unexpectedly, she said that her colleague, Michael Rodriguez, had a similar car. Why Michelle gave out this information remains unclear. However, thanks to her, the puzzle began to take shape. Police later determined that Michelle had simply blabbed the truth, or the plan the perpetrators were hatching was flawed. Detectives looked into Michael's identity. The man's criminal record heightened suspicions. He was brought in for questioning, to which he responded calmly. Mr. Rodriguez said that on the day of Nathan's murder, at around 9 p.m., he went out shopping. In the supermarket, the man met an interesting girl named Shannon. From his words, they had a long conversation, after which they decided to continue their acquaintance in the hotel room. Michael explained that they arrived at the hotel around 11 p.m., to verify the man's words, the officers called Shannon. She did indeed confirm the romantic encounter. However, the detective sensed a catch, so the next step was to examine the information in Mrs. Pyatt's phone. Specialists managed to recover the correspondence Michelle had with Michael for a year. Their communication was interesting. On the day of Nathan's murder, the couple discussed a contract with a certain Van Dyke, the conversation was more like encryption than a business negotiation. It was probably how the two men planned the crime. Investigators were almost certain that both were involved, but sufficient evidence had not yet been obtained, so they decided to let Michael go until the circumstances of the case are clarified. After examining Michelle's cell phone, 
The detectives called her back in for questioning. She was visibly agitated and seemed to be hiding something. Michelle realized that the officers knew more than she wanted to know, so she told them about her affair with Michael. A little later, she confessed that a few months before her husband's death, she and her lover had decided to kill Nathan. The woman explained that the action was planned in order to obtain insurance payments. Mrs. Payette justified herself and assured that she had repented and changed her mind. It was as if she had changed her mind at one stage in the preparation of the crime. She felt sorry for her husband, and she even tried to interfere with the plan. So she turned off her husband's alarm clock. Michelle was counting on her accomplices, not waiting for Nathan or missing him. But the investigators did not believe in the woman's remorse. Her correspondence eloquently testified otherwise. In addition, she sent Michael a cute smiley face right after she learned of her husband's death. After a while, Shannon came to the police station to confess. The woman must have realized her predicament. However, her involvement in the case was clearly embellished. She explained that Michael had forced her to provide an alibi. Jessica asked for my help. Her friends wanted to teach a big drug dealer a lesson. My job was only to cover up the involvement of one of the attackers. I thought it would be a way to get justice, she explained. She then added that on the night of the attack, Michael told the whole truth. Shannon assured police officers, As soon as I realized I was being used, I immediately went to the police. In addition, I feared for my life. There is no telling what they would have done to me. The woman's words were confirmed by the hotel's CCTV footage. It became clear that Michael and Shannon arrived at the hotel not at 11 p.m., as Michael himself said, but at 11.40 p.m. Her testimony led detectives to Corey and Jessica. Corey had long denied any involvement in the case. He knew what a guilty plea would do to a repeat offender. But Jessica did reveal her role in the sinister plan. To honor the young sergeant's memory, Nathan's family and friends gathered on December 7, 2010, in the chapel at the Nellis base. Michelle decided to skip the ceremony. She was clearly not in the mood for it. Many comrades remembered the man's stamina and military hardiness. The commander of the squadron told about the feats he had accomplished for his country and his family. Everyone characterized Nathan as a reliable comrade-in-arms. At the same time, they noted his modesty and decency. In his speech, Eric Pyatt recalled, My brother has always been an example for me and the rest of my family. He truly loved life, was devoted to his wife and children. Everything Nathan ever did, he did in the name of his homeland, love, and friends. On December 9th, the remains of the slain man were transported to Guam. On December 15th, a requiem mass was held at St. Francis Church in Tamuning. Military honors were paid to the sergeant at the Petey City Cemetery on the island of Guam. His funeral was spectacular. The cortege consisted of 36 motorcycles. Upon arrival at the burial site, six officers carried out a casket covered with a U.S. flag. Afterward, 21 shots shook the sky. Nathan Pyatt was given a hero's farewell. Michael Rodriguez, Corey Hawkins, and Jessica Austin were arrested without bail on December 8, 2010. The next day, the same fate awaited Michelle Payet. The police feared for the mental state of the accused. She was placed under surveillance to prevent her from committing suicide. On January 4, 2011, in Clark County District Court, the four accomplices were read the charges. They were charged with conspiracy to commit murder and robbery with a firearm and murder with a firearm. Michael and Corey were additionally charged with possession of a firearm. The trials dragged on for three years. Some of the defendants denied involvement. Armed with a strong defense team, the defendants filed more than one motion. Their aim was to exclude certain evidence and proofs from the case. However, the court rejected all the applications. They only delayed the inevitable punishment by postponing the sessions from one date to another. On September 21, 2015, the trial for the murder of Nathan Payette did take place. Michael Rudolph Rodriguez was the first to stand trial. To avoid the death penalty, he pleaded guilty. On September 29, 2015, 
The man was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Michael's appeal of the sentence was denied. At the time the sentence was announced, the defendant expressed no emotion. Apparently, he did not regret the crime he had committed. The trial of Michelle Payet took place in a Las Vegas court a month later. The woman continued to insist that she had changed her mind about killing her husband. When the judge allowed Michelle to say a few words in her defense, she turned to the parents of the murdered man. With tears in her eyes, she apologized to them. I loved Nathan and our children. I was very confused and made a big mistake, Michelle pronounced and once again fainted. The prosecutor said she did not believe the defendant wanted to thwart the conspiracy. There was a lot of evidence to the contrary. No one could understand how a woman, a mother of four children, could become so cold-blooded. The judge sided with the prosecution. Michelle was clearly involved in the crime, at least more than she claimed in court. Michelle soon pleaded guilty to conspiracy to commit murder and first-degree murder with a firearm. This helped her avoid capital punishment. The Payette family also asked the court not to impose the death penalty on the former relative. At the end of the hearing, the judge called Michelle's crime incomprehensible and unfathomable. In October 2015, it was the turn of a third defendant, Corey Alexis Hawkins. The man also agreed to a plea bargain to avoid the death penalty. Corey was sentenced to life in prison. His attorney's petition to ever get parole was denied. The judge reasoned that the defendant helped plan the crime and was nearby at the time of the shooting. Jessica Austin also took a plea deal with prosecutors. She was later charged with conspiracy to commit murder. In March 2016, Michelle was given her final sentencing. She once again cited her unstable emotional state that led her to commit the crime. She again asked Nathan's family to ever forgive her. Carmelita Payette was a deeply religious person. She could see that her former daughter-in-law was remorseful for what she had done and was truly tormented by remorse. Her soul needed forgiveness. Therefore, Nathan's mother forgave Michelle in the courtroom. Afterwards, she added that the most important punishment in life, Michelle had already suffered. Your children don't want to see you anymore. They're afraid you'll do to them what you did to their father, Carmelita explained. Our family does not pursue the principle of an eye for an eye, Eric Payette informed her. I think Michelle was shaken by her mother-in-law's words. Her family will move on without her, and the children will grow up knowing their mother is a murderer. Eric's wife, Veronica, also asked to speak out. She told Michelle that she hated her, after which she added that the relative dishonors the family name she carries. In pursuit of greed and the love of a man she didn't know, Michelle destroyed her family. She became the murderer of the man she once loved immensely, with whom she shared a bed and built a future. Could Michelle have imagined how her unbridled ambition would turn out? Hardly. This category of people lives in a perpetual pursuit of happiness without appreciating what they have. Nathan, unlike her, had lived his whole life giving of himself. He was often sleep-deprived risked his health and his life. Thanks to this, the man fulfilled his beloved's dreams, but never found her recognition. The children of the Payette family will remain traumatized for life. They will hardly be able to create strong families and socialize. The painful experience of their parents will remain in front of their eyes for the rest of their days. There is only one good thing about this story. The four criminals will stay where they belong. Thanks for watching, guys. That was Jack with you. Subscribe to the channel. There are many shocking stories ahead.